And I'd like to welcome you guys to the Black Love Recovery Channel. And thank you again for making time for sitting down and talking with the Black community. So I would like for you guys to just go ahead and do a quick introduction and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, sounds good. Um, I am Shaniqua Horstead. Um, I'm 28 years old, um, born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, yeah, that's pretty much me. I um, pretty simple. Uh, definitely a believer of Christ. I am a mom. I think family is so important um, to me, family and friends. I would do anything for my family and friends. <laughs> and um, that's pretty much uh, me. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Maurice. Uh, I'm 38. Uh, I'm originally from Alabama. I spent 11 years in the Army, mm -hmm. um, after which I moved here to Charlotte. Uh, and I met this lovely young lady here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. And uh, the rest is still being written. <laughs> awesome. I love that. And I love that you touched on that. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But can you guys go ahead and share a little bit of how you guys met and what attracted you guys to one another in the beginning? Sure. Ladies first. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably be doing that the whole time, looking at each other, That's wanting to be the person. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how we met, um, we actually met at work. Um, I was working in a contact center, and Maurice was working in the IC department at the contact center. Um, and he would always, like, show up for our break and our lunches and my mom actually who's on here with us she actually worked there with me and she's like why are you always coming around on your <laughs> breaks and lunch <laughs> he always just showing up like is he stalking me or something <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he, he was like always just like showing up and um you know when they we were talking about you know food and where we were going to eat for lunch and he actually made a suggestion and we went there um to get some food or whatever and that was like the first thing we kind of like did together and um that's pretty much like how we met that was like five years ago now it's crazy that that seems like a long time ago but it's like five years five years it doesn't seem like it was that long ago but it's like that was five years ago mm -hmm. so nice. that's how we met <laughs> <laughs> nice would you like to add anything to that Maurice uh no I mean she pretty much covered it all I um I knew her trainer, so I would like message him and ask him like, hey, what time are you guys going to break? What time is your lunch? <laughs> that way I could, you know, make myself visible mm -hmm. each time that she was, you know, exiting. Uh, so that way uh, I could play it off like, you know, I just happened to be out there at that mm -hmm. time. <laughs> you like, I mean, you picked up on it though. Like your mom picked up on it too. She did, like, she was, like, he's always out there, and, like, walking us, um, you know, to the car at night, like, after work, he was, like, walking us to the car and stuff, okay. so that's, like, how we met. Okay, that's awesome. So, Maurice, the first question I have is for you, um, because, you know, single women, we often have this, like, looking at men, we have this, like, okay, he's a mystery, or we really don't think about it, so can you share from the man's perspective, talk about that mentality that you had with your approach and pursuing a woman, the question I have here is, is it safe to say that most men will do similar acts of like being intentional with, you know, letting a woman know that he's interested and if he's not somewhat going out of his way to let her know that that women can safely assume that he's just not that into her? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> I would... It's a great question. <laughs> I, I usually don't like to generalize, but I think I can pretty much safely say that if a man is interested in a woman, um, he will show intent. Mm -hmm. um, even shy, like really passive uh, guys will show some type of intent mm -hmm. um, to show that he's interested. Um, even with that, um, he may not be as like vocal and, you know, being obvious like I was and like, you know, being visible, mm -hmm. but he will show some type of intent. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think you could ever cross the boundary of just um, knowing of someone to actually knowing them if you don't at some point have some type of communication. Mm. Um, so I, I think 
uh, he has to be very intentional. Um, and then he has to be, um, he either has to lie and uh, cover his true intent. You know, there are guys who are just, you know, trying to go after the sex. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. Um, he either has to lie to cover that intent or he has to be truthful and let you know that uh, what his true intentions are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So pretty much like if he's interested, whatever his intent is, there has to be some sort of like, I guess, intention on his part. And then also the other layer of that is being intentional with your actual intentions, whether it's right. to actually get to know her or if it's just to take her to the bedroom. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you for breaking that down. Um, the next question I had was, during your dating and courting process, was there ever a period of time where you called it quits and maybe stopped talking to each other and like maybe took a break? And if so, could you share a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, I guess I'll start since you're looking okay. at me from start first. <laughs> uh, so um, during the time period she was pregnant with our son, um, we really were um, not settled as far as our relationship issues. Uh, we still had a lot of things that we hadn't really addressed. Um, and we swept a lot of things under the rug and didn't really like just confront it head on. And um, if you combine um, unresolved issues with pregnancy hormones, <laughs> you're, Combining yourself up for a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, it became a point to where we were um, always at odds with each other. Um, fights uh, would become like we need to distance ourselves from each other for a while. Like we don't even talk to each other. Um, there was even a point where we like really weren't talking for like days at a time. Mm -hmm. And then if we did say something, it would just be like... Um, you know, a hey or bye, nothing really um, truly involving as mm -hmm. far as the relationship is concerned. And then um, there was a point uh, where I had started sleeping on the couch and she was uh, sleeping uh, in the bed and we just kind of disconnected uh, totally at that point. And after that point, it was a moment where we called it quits. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting because um, she was pregnant, but I would like rarely hear from her. Mm -hmm. And I, I would reach out occasionally, but not like consistently. Um, but she actually called me on the day that she was going into labor. <laughs> Um, and I was at work. I was actually getting ready to leave work to go to a basketball game because I had a basketball game that night. And she called me and was like, hey, uh, I'm in labor. You may want to come to the hospital. So I was like, OK, well, let me get to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we were still um, kind of apart at that moment. Um, but we were just, you know, doing what was best for our child, you know, um, co-parenting. and. Uh, we eventually decided to actually try things again, maybe like a couple months down the road, maybe two, three months down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it was definitely um, a difficult time. Um, like you said, there were a lot of issues in our relationship that we just kind of, you know, slept under the rug. Um, just to kind of add some context to that, um, Maurice does have another child prior to our relationship, and I'm his second one. He was actually married before me, and um, during the time that we were dating, um, and some people might think this is like too much information for an interview, but like during the time that we were dating, he was actually technically still married. They were just they were separated. They had not been together. I'm not mm -hmm. a homeworker, <laughs> but <laughs> they were already like separated, and um, you know different places have different stipulations on the time frame that you have to be separated. So yeah. that was one of the things that was kind of like weighing on our relationship because I was like, you know, that wasn't something that you told me like when we first started dating, you just kind of like came out along the way. And then it was like awkward because, you know, I, as you can imagine, you know, being his second wife and meeting his family after he was already married, it was just kind of weird, um, you know, 
building that relationship. And then, um, you know, at the place that we worked, it was a contact center. So people were always gossiping and saying, you know, oh, he's this, no, he's that. But, you know, just working through those issues was a challenge for us at first. And we really did sweep a lot of things under the rug, like you said. Um, another thing that I can recall us kind of getting into it about was like, um, like holidays and stuff, because he's not really like into like pagan holidays, Christmas and things like that. So I was like, you know, sitting here crying on the couch, pregnant, like, what if my kid wants to celebrate Christmas? What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just like working through those things that people don't really talk about, um, you know, and just being real, you know, about how you feel, because that's important to me. I want my kids to open up gifts on Christmas. And, you know, when you meet someone, that's not something that you talk about. It's just like, you know, happens along the way, you know, if that makes sense. And then people argue about it when it gets to that time and the anger and frustration just, you know, builds and builds and builds. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, hard. And I really mostly went through that pregnancy without him, you know, because of my own actions, but, you know, really it was on both of us, but it was mostly me. Um, you know, I went through that pregnancy really without him. Cause this was before we were married when we were having our son Bryson. And, um, you know, I never thought that we would get back together, but then when Bryson came and of course he was around and seeing him, you know, with Bryson and stuff like that, of course that brought back those feelings. And I was actually the one that was like, Hey, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, hey, nice. um, mm -hmm. what do you think about us, you know, doing your idea, whatever? And then, you know, I think he was kind of confused at first about, you know, me asking him that, but it worked out. <laughs> okay, good stuff. So I would like to um, dive into that a little bit more. The question I have here is if you could both share a little bit from your perspective, how the pregnancy can change a relationship and maybe what are some of the additional pressures or strains it could add? So you kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you like share a little bit more, you know, from each of your perspectives as far as pregnancy and relationships are concerned, like another couple that might be experiencing, you know, having their first child and some of the, you know, from a woman's standpoint, I know men are aware that we go through some things. <laughs> yeah. Can you share, like, you know, from each of your perspectives, so the other people that are out there that might be expecting their first child or when they get to that point, they can say, hey, I remember this, hearing this story and I'm kind of better prepared. Um, yeah, so for me, one thing that I would say um, is not to make a um, life-changing decision when you are pregnant because you are... <laughs> hormonal and uh -huh. you don't know that you're hormonal like when you're in that time period or that space you don't realize that mm -hmm. it's just the hormones it feels very real like the things that you're feeling the thoughts that you think you're thinking feels very real you don't realize that you're actually just hormonal mm -hmm. and it might not actually be that bad so mm -hmm. I would just say um you know don't make rash, des rash decisions while you're pregnant and then I would also say um we want to be pre prepared when we have kids, you know, we want to have this much in savings. We want to have this type of house. We want to have this type of car and it doesn't always work out that way. So if you're in that particular situation, I would also say, um, use the people around you who are willing to help you and, you know, lift you up. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, because having a child can put a strain on your relationship, just in the fact of, like I said, um, you know, when it comes to holidays, when it comes to how we raise kids, we're both very, have very different parenting styles, you know, like he said, he was in the military, so he's more stern with our kids, and I'm more like a, the pushover, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they manipulate me so easily, uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, based on, you know, how he is, you know, I'm like the pushover, and, you know, just, working through you know how you're going to parent can be a struggle and then not to mention how you're going to take care of each, the child mm -hmm. is just another strain you know on the relationship because regardless of how much money you might have saved up you never really know how much it's going to cost you know when it comes to a baby yeah so you know um I know we want to be prepared and you know the advice that I would give is not to make rash decisions 
and to just be patient with yourself because you guys might disagree, but you're also hormonal when you're pregnant. So although you disagree right now, just be patient with your body and be patient with yourself because in four months, you may feel totally different like I did. So <laughs> you know, like I couldn't stand the look of him, but you just might feel totally different in four months. And I think, you know, I, when I wrote this in my response, I think our um, generation is so easy to just be like, nah, I'm done. Like, I'm cool on that. And just walk away. And, you know, because I never thought that we would get back together. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we're so easy to just be like, oh, it's whatever. I'm, I'm done with him. I can't stand his, I can't stand his face. Can't stand his good. Mm-hmm. And just give up on your relationship when that could just really be your person. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. All right, Maurice, talk to me. <laughs> uh, from a male from a perspective, um, dealing with a woman who is pregnant is a challenge within itself um, because you have to deal with those hormones. You have to deal with those emotions. You have to deal with um, her body changing mm-hmm. and her adapting to it, uh, how she feels about herself. All of those things are projected onto you as the man. Um, if you're not ready for that, it can be a lot of pressure. It can be a lot of um, anxiety and stress. Um, even if you think you're ready, you're probably still not ready. But um, how you handle that is really uh, what's going to be the test of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, my advice, if I'm giving advice, uh, would definitely be to exercise more patience. Mm -hmm. Um, There's gonna be attacks on you that you're just gonna have to take because that's just how she feels at the moment. Um, It may not be necessarily true, uh, like she said. Uh, It could just be how she's feeling at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, It may be hurtful words because maybe she just doesn't know how to express it at that moment. Um, But um, be patient uh, because um in the end if you're really trying to be together then that is um also showing her that you are able to handle that pressure and that anxiety and that stress and that you can move forward with other challenges that the relationship may bring Mm -hmm. um also i would say that um if you truly love someone, that is one of the major tests of a relationship, um, dealing with pregnancy. Of course, there's other challenges, but uh, dealing with pregnancy and um, being supportive, mm-hmm. being the one that's there that she can count on, regardless of how she's treated you or whatever she said. Um, to some, especially in this day and age, to some, that may, that may sound soft. Mm-hmm. Um, that may sound weak, but if you can't be vulnerable to the person that you love and the person that you plan to spend your life with, then uh, you're really yeah. wasting your time with that person. Yeah. I mean, there's no point in you being with them. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say, you know, just uh, endure. Mm-hmm. Endure. Wow. Hey, excellent point. I really love how you um, tied into that and said that um, pretty much that's what a relationship is, is learning how to, you know, whether through those things, especially pregnancy, because most people, when you get married, you know, you're looking to have kids and a family. And as um, Shaniqua said that, hey, sometimes we just don't have control. (laughs) It's a little bit beyond our control. So I do want to ask, would you be able to or want to offer like any specifics, like for when a woman is going through her, um, you know, emotional phases and the hormones are, rag- are raging. Do you have any advice that you could offer to the men on maybe like how to approach it? Like, do you think like space and you too, um, Shaniqua, do you feel like, would you want, you know, to have that space? Like, is that something or would you want to know, okay, maybe he's over there and then I'll have, you know, we'll get back together when we're, you know, like, how does that, what do you think about that? Um, everyone, every person is different, of course. I think that, um, it goes, it, this is where I would tie in, like, um, love languages. So, like, I think you just have to know, um, from your past experience before, like, she was pregnant, what kind of stuff she likes and how to, like, make her feel good, um, and doing, like, little gestures, genuine 
gestures, not just like, oh, okay, I bought you flowers just because that sounds like a typical thing to do, you know, just like something um, meaningful. Like we used to write sticky notes to each other. So um, that was very <laughs> like cute. And, you know, I have a letter that he wrote me before okay. too. So, you know, that was like my um, thing that, you know, I was like, um, you know, and I didn't make it easy for him. So I can't really say like what he might think but that would be my thing just think about what she liked before and be as genuine you know as possible that, as you can and it's okay to give space um mm -hmm. I think that it's okay to give space um um solitude is good even though you're in a relationship with somebody it's still important to have solitude have your alone time so if she needs, you know, if the argument is or the, the conversation is turning negative or is turning to be harsh or mean, that's when, you know, I would say give her space um, and be okay with that. Um, some space may give her time to clear her head. And then there's also times where you could give like little gestures. You don't necessarily have to buy things or you know anything like that but just give like nice gestures like, like maybe make dinner or something yeah something like that make dinner you know leave her a note you know I'm you know I'm sorry about last night but can we try and talk about it again later you know something like that um and I think tying back to also something that he said is you know how she feels about herself during pregnancy your body is changing it, it can be just difficult you know to be comfortable you know when you're pregnant you know feel prettier you know for some people so just um, for me, words of affirmation, um, you yeah. know, reassuring that, you know, I, I think that you look great how you, how you are, you know, I'm still attracted to you, you know, how you look and things like that. Nice. I like the tie into the um, five love languages. Yeah. Would you like to add anything to that, Maurice? Um, I would just say that um, as a man, you probably, during that time period, you're probably not going to feel like you're doing anything right. Um, no matter, you know, if you buy her favorite candy, flowers, or whatever, um, you're probably still not going to receive the same um, response yeah. as you would when she wasn't pregnant. Um, yeah. So even though it may not seem like you're doing right, she still takes mental note, regardless yeah. of yeah. her reaction. She, she still takes mental note. And um, I would just say keep pressing on. Um, learn to know when to really give her space if she's wanting it. Like sometimes, uh, especially during pregnancy, like women will claim to want space, but what they <laughs> want is for you to really be closer. Mm -hmm. And they want you to push past that soft wall that they're putting up. Yeah. Um, but if you really know them and are intimate in the aspect of knowing them, you know, like when they're really fed up with you and want you to just disappear. <laughs> um, so um, I would think that is very important, knowing those boundaries when you really need to leave her alone versus when she's just acting like she, oh, excuse me, she acting like she wants you to leave her alone, but she really wants you to like push past that wall to show her some affection and some love. Excellent. I love what both of you have shared. So my takeaway from that is for men, kind of see pregnancy as like a season that you got to <laughs> sure. Tough it out. <laughs> yeah. And then also I love what you said, Maurice, about um, like, knowing the difference between when she really is like okay I really need that space and it's like a or when it's like a soft wall and like she really wants you to be there and to be close so maybe um I guess like the small acts that you were talking about a little bit earlier about um like maybe doing dinner or doing dishes or something soft acts or small you know little acts to let her know you know that you're still you know there even though there's a whole distance so yeah. Okay. That's my takeaway from it. <laughs> okay. Now I did want to, um, Shaniqua talk about in your response, you mentioned that you are both very different. You process things differently and, um, you can hear the same thing, but interpret it differently. And it did bring some struggles with, um, communication. Um, something else that you had also mentioned, I think I skipped ahead a little bit is, um, I'm going to read what you said so that you can understand the question that I'm going to ask. It says, you said that I realized things were, 
I realized these things were a part of the story we were writing together and we were in control of how the rest of the story would go, not outside influences. And then the piece where I talked about, you said that you guys are different, you process things differently, you could get different interpretations from the same conversation. The question that I was gonna ask you is, can you speak more to when you said that you came to a point where you realized certain things were just gonna be part of the relationship and you were both in control of how the rest of the story would go. And then after that, could you talk a little bit, both of you, if you could speak a little bit to how you guys interpret things differently and what strategies do you use when you communicate with one another to try to minimize like the misinterpretations? So I know it's a two part question. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think I got it. So, um, um, okay, so when it comes to um, realizing that certain things were just gonna be a part of our relationship, like the communication aspect is one of them. Um, Maurice is very um, analytical, I feel like. He is very smart and intuitive. He knows a lot of words. He's a great speller. He can do math in his head. <laughs> He's just, you know, a, I would consider him a smart person. Uh, whereas me, on the other hand, you know, I, I'm not like, I'm not like not smart, but I'm just not as smart as he is. Gotcha. And so <laughs> I got what you're trying to say. <laughs> I'm just not as smart as he is. Like I, he's more like book smart and I'm more of, you know, like domestic, like I'm better around the house, you know, go things like that. I'm more of like, gotcha. you know, putting clothes together for the kids, making sure we gotta coordinate outfits, you know, I'm you know smart when it comes to this. I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so um when we communicate and when we talk about things you know, I can be kind of, um, I can come off kind of harsh because I already know what I want done. I already know what I want to say. And so sometimes when I speak, I can come off as harsh, not just to him, sometimes to other people as well. I can be very um, stern. I'm a, I'm a, tor a Taurus as well. So Hey, we'll say that we are, you <laughs> yes, people, people say that we are, you know, stubborn and bullheaded, which, okay, that's fine. I can take that. And um, when Maurice hears certain things, it can, when it comes off kind of harsh to him, he may, you know, get offended or it may come out, you know, turn out to be rude and I didn't intend it to be that way. So communication, that, that different thought pattern, that different thought process, um is always going to be a part of our relationship because we just think differently so I can say something to him and mean it in the best way but if I don't say it in the right tone or if I don't say it you know the right way you know to him it can come off wrong I can also say something to him like um I'm going out this weekend I'm going to hang out with the girls this weekend and then or I'm thinking about going out with the girls this weekend. But to him, I never said, hey, I'm going to do this at this time with these people. And so then when the day comes, he's like, well, you never told me. And I feel like I did tell you, but he's like, you didn't tell me because you didn't give me details. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. just working through that communication can be difficult to us. So what we've been doing or what I've been doing is really trying to um, slow down what I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of, if I'm saying like, hey, I want to tell you this before I forget, make sure we both have undivided attention, especially if it's something serious. Um, make sure we both have undivided attention and get his clear, get his, gain his buy-in, I guess you could say. Like when you take business classes, they tell you to like gain the person's <laughs> buy-in. So yeah. I guess like gaining his buy-in, like, okay, this is um, what I want to do. Um, does that make sense to you? Do you have any questions, you know, about what I said? Just making sure we're on the same page. So it kind of feels like, um, like not talking to him like he's like slow, but walking through the conversation slowly together like so it's you, not, you have to slow down yourself right because so, you're going like Pew, and he's kind of like okay i don't know where you're going like <laughs> exactly <laughs> he's he's like, very, okay. okay like why why are we talking about this or why are you telling me that and then just explain to him you know the back story sometimes has really helped us so like i might say you know we're going to the beach for christmas and then he's like why 
So like just explaining to him and, you know, making it more of a partnership versus just me making decisions for us. Because Maurice, he can be very, you know, laid back and he's just like, whatever, you know, whatever you want to do. And I just take that sometimes and I'm like, oh, he doesn't care. We'll be there. I tell like friends or family, like he doesn't care. We'll be there. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll do something or plan something. And then I'm like, oh, tomorrow we're going to this birthday party. (laughs) so just making sure that I am one actually communicating with him in a way that works not just for me but also for him and what he wants to hear and what he needs as well and then making sure that before we leave the table or before we leave the conversation that we're as much on the same page as possible um is really something that has helped us um in communicating and I think that was the question um Mm -hmm just how, what was I talking about when I said we had to realize that some things are going to be a part of our relationship regardless. Yeah. Our communication skills, we can't change how we are. You know, he's, he's also 10 years older than I am. So <laughs> <laughs> he's a little bit more old school than I am. So, you know, there's that <laughs> as a factor. I love it. <laughs> that plays a factor in our communication as well, because mm-hmm. he's like a little bit more old school. And I'm just like, you know, this is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I can't be, you can't be like that in a relationship, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that, those two things play a factor. And then how we overcome them is just like really slowing down the conversation, making sure each other understands and um, rewording has been really powerful. I feel like for us, because sometimes like I can say something and like it might offend him, but if I just reword it or say it like in a different way, that helps us a lot. Yep, that is important. Very important. All right, Maurice, would you like to add? <clears throat> uh, as far as the communication aspect, I would say um, one of the things that I've done is to slow down and ask intentional questions to get mm-hmm. the answers that I want so that she doesn't omit anything and then I don't get the answer that I truly want. Um, because like she said, uh, you know, she'll be like, oh, tomorrow we're going to a birthday party. And I'll be like, uh, whose birthday party? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, um, for me, in communication style, I would lead off with, hey, tomorrow is such and such as birthday party. Mm-hmm. But for her, she's just like, no, we're going to a birthday party tomorrow. So um, just understanding those differences like for me I started to ask more questions um and I never like she she stated that she feels like I'm smarter I never in any way feel like I'm smarter than her Mm um I never try to use intellect to um my advantage in any case um I think um, just like uh, one of the comments in the chat, I mean, I think we both have our strengths and weaknesses. Mm, yeah. um, and I, I think that um, sometimes, and this is probably going to lead into something else you had on the uh, questionnaire, oh, yeah. but sometimes I think that um, she doesn't see her own strengths. Yeah. And so sometimes I speak to them so that maybe it will spark something. So even in communication, sometimes like me actually just talking, I try to speak to where I know she's capable versus where she's at. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. There there are many times where, um, like she, she was talking about words of affirmation and things of that nature. There's many times where even when she presents an idea, she's already doubting herself. Mm-hmm. Whereas... Um, I've, I've tried my best um, since we've been together to support any endeavor that she wants to jump down. Like, I don't care what it is. If you make <laughs> it make sense to me, mm-hmm. then let's do it. Nice. I got your back. We're going to go nice. for it. We're going to be in 100%. Um, and I think um, sometimes she doesn't realize that she really has a power in her voice. Mm. So her communication, like she said, sometimes it comes off harsh. 
is because the way she says it, there's power in her voice. So if she comes at it with any type of any, any type of negative connotation, mm-hmm. to me, that's already defeated. Gotcha. So I will generally want to speak the opposite of that or speak to something that is going to open up more thought. Sometimes uh, for her, and <laughs> it's funny because like I'll I'll say something to invoke thought for her and then she'll come back later on and like speak in an open thought process about the idea that she originally had Mm -hmm. but now we're coming back to it with more thought and more um real details to it Mm -hmm. so um to me that's funny because like I'm like, well, why didn't you just think of this in the first <laughs> place? But uh-huh. all right, it's cool. You know, you didn't have to. Let's, mm-hmm. let's just, you know, go with what you're saying now. Nice. So, um, I think uh, as far as like communication and support, um, those are things that have worked for me to communicate better with her and then also get a better understanding of where she's coming from. Because generally the most... Um, the most faults in communication come from the understanding. Mm. Uh, if you don't understand the person, then you're probably just coming up with your own assumption of yeah. what you think they're trying to say. And yeah. then that may not be right. And that causes conflict and worse. And um, I think getting a better understanding for me has definitely worked out for us. Yeah, that's, I think that's important. Getting the understanding is really important. Excellent. I love how you say that, you know, you started asking intentional questions to make sure that you did receive, you know, the intended message and the intended understanding. So um, you guys touch on this a little bit, too, when you mentioned like the differences with age and like being 10 years apart. Is there any like other maybe aspects of that that you would say or like that you would like to share when it comes to you mentioned the communication being different? So like you guys, you know, we connecting with that. Are there any other aspects? Because um, like, you know, someone was interested in dating older, as am I, <laughs> for um, people to like, you know, be aware of and maybe to consider, like as far as differences. Um, I don't think that um, our age gap really plays much of a difference outside of the communication aspect. Um, I would say, um, when it comes to, um, how do you say, like uh, preparing for your future, mm-hmm. it's a little bit more um, front of mind for him, you know, than more so for me. I feel like, like I got more time to really put money into my 401k, <laughs> but he's like, you know, <laughs> no, I want to make sure that if something happens tomorrow that, you know, you and all the kids are fine and gotcha. blah, blah, blah. So it's like more prevalent for him than for me, it's not really like a big deal. Um, so preparing for like your future, you know, is a com- different plan. type of conversation. Like yeah. with people that I dated, that was my age. It was never like a conversation that we had. Um, but, you know, we make sure we pay that all the time. We make sure it's front, front facing. It's always very, you know, it's always been very important for him to be able to, you know, always be able to provide for us regardless, even if something happens to him. So um, I think that's a factor. And then um, I think that our age plays a difference as far as our parenting. Mm-hmm. I feel like he was, he's a little bit more old school than I am when it comes to <laughs> parenting. Um, but I think that those communication, you know, preparing for your future and, um, you know, parenting styles is really the main things that are different. But as far as like traveling, like doing fun stuff, like it doesn't. <laughs> excellent i like those points that you brought up excellent okay maurice would you like to anything uh, i really only have two points in reference to it um the first as a guy like when i first met her i think she was 22 about to be 23 um oh, baby <laughs> so you you definitely have to understand that the maturity that um you've gained now that you're older Mm -hmm. is not what she has yet like Mm -hmm. I saw the potential of who she is now Mm -hmm. way back then 
Nice. But getting her to walk in that, it was virtually impossible. <laughs> um, so it takes it takes true patience for a guy. If you're a guy watching and you're you know trying to date younger, um, it takes true patience to watch uh, the maturity level grow, the responsibility level grow, and then just the um, self value mm. um, grow. Um, the things that she did. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the things that she did at 22, you know, like uh, she doesn't even have an interest in those things anymore. Mm. So it's just like um, you have to be patient and watch those things develop. Um, and even all the time, like one of uh, our close friends, we used to always say, "Man, when she grows up a little bit more, she's really gonna blossom." Like that was one of the things we used to say all the time. And like back then, it was frustrating because it was just like, man, it, I wish you would just get the like, but, Are you uh, slow, girl? Like, but, get uh, there. but after that, um, like I, I've continually watched her just really come into her own and mm -hmm. really like um, step into what I already saw that she could mm -hmm. be even back then. Nice. Um, my second point to this is uh, a little deeper than the surface than what most people think. Um, I think the the gap in our age represents two different generations, mm. but us being together, one of our main goals in our relationship is to break all of that generational stuff. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, so I think it allows us to take the good things and bad things from both generations, mesh them together to form who we are and mm -hmm. the example that we're going to set for generations to come. I love that. Um, like, it's it's crazy how, like, sometimes, and we laugh at it, sometimes we can see other couples trying to emulate the things that we do. Mm -hmm. And it's just, like, funny. Like, I'll see like some woman copy stuff that my wife does or like she'll see uh, somebody trying to be like us in like certain aspects and it's kind of funny <laughs> but like to know that we have that influence it's um, a compliment as well yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um and also knowing that we have the influence is also something that um comes with responsibility and making yeah. sure that we are doing the right things we are setting the right example um and I mean there there's been older couples that uh have said things about our relationship that they wish they had yeah so um with that like for us to have that type of influence over people um speaks volumes over um the general goal of our relationship um which is to break those generational ties break those generational curses uh, things that have uh, followed um, in our family for generations. Mm -hmm. um, we want to stand and be an example that, hey, you don't have to do things that way. Yeah. Come together and do things a different way. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and we keep, we keep it real. We keep it real, real. Like anytime we're like talking about relationships with people or people like mm -hmm. ask him, you know, like stuff and advice and stuff. We try to keep it as, you know, transparent as possible. We don't ever try to, like, fake the funk. Like, we have real life problems, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's one of the things, really, that attracts people to us is that, you know, we're never trying to, like, fake the funk. We're never trying to act like we have a perfect relationship or a perfect marriage. And I think people need to, well, people, I don't want to say need to, because I don't want to make it sound like I'm like your mom, but <laughs> I think people should try to understand that um, marriage and, you know, long lasting marriages are about choices. Hmm. And, you know, if you have to make that choice and that, that commitment every day hmm. to, you know, make your marriage work, it's not like you get married, you know, this is your anniversary and you are good for a year and then after that, you stop putting in effort you right. know, just because you got the certificate, like you're in it forever. The right. certificate is just so you're married by law. Right. The relationship part yep. is an everlasting 
always changing uh, mechanism. Like you said, you know, maturing over time, the things that I liked before, I don't like now. So we have to navigate through that together in our relationship and figure out, you know, how to continue to make things work and be productive while still carrying the responsibility, I feel like, of, you know, other people, you know, looking to us for advice or looking to us as an example or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, I'm happy to be that for people, but we always want to stay true to us. Yeah. We don't want to, um, we will never allow, you know, outside factors or outside opinions to determine how we handle our business or how we raise our kids or whatever it is. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and um, move to the next question now. I would like to ask you guys, what would you say is the best part of being married? A lot. <laughs> um, if I like, I think the best part, and I think this was my answer, I don't know. The best part about being married for me is knowing that um, we both have made this decision. Like I'm always going to be able to, um, he's always going to be right here with me. I'm always going to have somebody to, you know, go through hard times with somebody to always go through bad times with, because, you know, you have friends that come and go, you have family members that come and go. Um, but I'm always going to have my partner beside me, no matter if I'm right, if I'm wrong, I'm always going to have somebody to care for me and love me regardless of the decisions that I make, you know, even if it's the wrong decision, even if it's a bad decision, you know, I have somebody that I can always go to and um, we're always going to be doing this together. I never have to um, do anything by myself. Like, um, like I had COVID, <laughs> I, had, I had coronavirus. Mm -hmm. and so just knowing that I can lean on him to take care of the kids when I'm sick or I can't get out the bed. I know my kids are going to be taken care of. I know that our household is going to be taken care of. I don't have to worry about that. So just that weight of worry, not having that is like one of the best parts of about being married. And although we don't have, we don't have like every single moment of our marriage is not happy all the time, every single day. I know that we're always going to be happy together because of how we work together. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to compete with each other. One's not trying to be right over the other. We're always, you know, working together. And so I think that's a huge weight lifted off my shoulders because I don't have to worry about, you know, him always, you know, trying to pressure me to do something. We're always working together versus, you know, one person making all the decisions over the other. So that's like, the best part Glad you're feeling better too <laughs> <laughs> thank you oh my gosh wow maurice um, i would say um my answer kind of ties into the same thing she said um like having that person there makes the difference um i remember being single and coming home and not having anybody there um to share your day with or to oh. Um, share like just moments of joy with um, but having that person there to be your partner um, to understand um, what you're going through and then provide comfort provide solutions um, someone that can um, take all your fears of life away um, and turn them into points of um, positivity, um, someone who can um, bring the best out of you, even when you wasn't so sure of things yourself, they could bring the best out of you. Mm. Um, all of those things. Uh, I mean, I, I would definitely say, like, um, even those challenges we had early on in communication, um, I would say that that brought out more of me trying to work at communication versus just saying, I'm going to stick to how I am. If mm -hmm. you're not down with that, then you can go on somewhere. Like I, it became a, I need to work at this to mm -hmm. be better. How can we make it work? Um, and then also just the fact that you have a person with you that pushes you to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and for anybody who's listening, if you don't have someone in, 
in your relationship that's pushing you to be better, then you're probably not in a relationship with the right person. Mm. Um, if if you're not always constantly trying to do better than you did the day before, then you're going to be complacent, and complacency has no place in a relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. Complacency causes relationships to stall, yeah. to become disconnected, become um, just routine. Yep. Whereas mm-hmm. um, if someone's pushing you to be better, do better, um, become a better person, then um, you always have that in your mind. Well, I know I can't slack off because she's going to keep, you know, stand on my back about making sure I'm good to go. Um, so um i that's good i have that mental push in the back of my mind uh, like she said you know I, I try to make sure like if anything happened to me that uh her and the kids are taken care of um but every day that i work you know i try to prove to be the best so that way um i get in line for promotions i i try to get raises things of that nature mm-hmm. to make sure that my family is straight mm-hmm. um and at the end of the day, that, that truly makes me happy in marriage. Like knowing that my family is happy um, at the end of the day, seeing my kids being able to just sit comfortably and we all watch a movie together. Like to me, um, that's happiness because I sat as a kid and watched my mom as a single mom. You know, sometimes she wasn't home because she's working two jobs or if she was home. You know, we'd have to stay up late to even talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And um like for me coming home and knowing that my family is here and we can sit down and be settled um we don't have any threats of the lights being turned off or anything like that uh we can eat what we want to stuff like that like those are things that make me truly happy and knowing that my relationship is stable Love it. So I got to give you some respect on your response. And you didn't say it directly, but you kind of tied into it when you said in a relationship, rather than just walking away from, you know, any of the issues that you faced, you saw it as an opportunity to pretty much own it. In your response, you said that our marriage is ours and there's no comparison to anyone else's. And I was like, that's powerful because again, that shows that, you you know, you take ownership of it. And yeah, I love that. So respect. (laughs) All right. So the question I have is for you, um, Ms. Shaniqua. Um, The question that I have is um, if you could speak a little bit more to these points. In your response, you said that we are conditioned Condition to be so independent that we don't know as far as a woman is concerned that we could be conditioned to be so independent that we don't know how to let someone else carry some of the weight for us and then you also said that we share some of the same desires to break you and your husband you share the same desire to break generational curses and you both believe that marriage is a holy a holy union between you know the three of three, you and God, the two of you and God. So can you share a little bit more to that? Maybe some examples when you were talking about like women, we are conditioned to be so independent and we don't know how to let someone else carry the load for us um, when we are in a marriage. Um, yes. So um, my mother was a single mother um, as well. And I did see her date, you know, and things like that. But she is very independent. Like sometimes she does not even ask me for help. <laughs> So, and she's not the only person that I've seen, you know, be that way. A lot of women, you know, in our family, a lot of women, you know, that I know from work and school are just very independent. And I think that that comes from being let down Mm -hmm. so many times by the wrong person or so many times by the wrong relationship being let down Um, and men not really meeting the expectations that we have for them. Um, and I think that if we were, uh, we would allow ourselves to be just a little bit more vulnerable, not like be a pushover or, you know, be, you know, easier right, like right. that. But if we would just allow ourselves to be a little bit more vulnerable with the right person, um, we could, we would see a lot more successful relationships. Um, I know for me, uh, when it comes to like doing things around the house, um, you know, doing things for the kids. I'm always usually, I, I have, I've learned to catch myself now, but I'm usually the one that's like doing everything for them for the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. But I've had to learn in my relationship and, you know, with my marriage that 
I don't have to do all of that by myself anymore. I have a partner, you know, who I can say, hey, you give them their bath and I'll put their night clothes on. You brush their teeth and I will fix their dinner or whatever the case may be. Just learning how to work together versus, you know, I'm just going to do everything by myself and just wear myself out until I'm tired and beat down. (laughs) <laughs> we don't have to do that. I feel like we, um, you know, are, especially African-American women, Black women, I feel like people have put this, um, put this responsibility of being so strong on us. It's like, oh, Black women are so strong. Black women are so powerful. And we are, yes, and we should be. Every woman is powerful and every woman is strong. Um, but I feel like if we would have just allowed ourselves to be a little bit more vulnerable, we would, mm-hmm. you know, have a lot more, um, you know, successful relationships. Yeah. Um, and that was just, you know, some of the ways that it has impacted my relationship with my husband, because like, I would be wearing myself out, you know, trying to work a full-time job, trying to get my business off the ground, trying to care for every single thing that the kids need, care for every single thing that he needs, make sure everything is perfectly aligned and in order and not give him anything to do, anything to do and I'm sitting here you know <laughs> suffering because I'm not asking for help right. and I'm not being um vocal about needing or wanting help so yeah I definitely think I agree with that I think that's kind of sort of like maybe like a rite of passage for especially I can only speak from a black woman's perspective but maybe you know from all other women's perspective is that hey you know rather than just automatically going into superwoman mode and you know carrying everything so much, learn to ask for help, learn to say, hey, you know, and speak up to that regard. So mm-hmm. definitely agree with that. All right. So what would you guys say that you struggle with as a couple or maybe as an individual when it comes to being married? And how did you find ways to make progress? What are some of the strategies that you might um, t- um, have used? So I know that we talked about the communication a lot. And I think that um, you already said, Maurice, about like asking more questions to try to get an understanding of um, what was going on and still work in progress, but hey, you know, mm-hmm. that's part of it. I'll go ahead and let you guys answer that and then I'll fill in any of the key points that I saw mentioned the responses. So if you could just share a little bit about um, maybe, I know we hit the communication pretty heavy, but were there any other maybe struggles that you would like to speak to to kind of give other um, new couples or singles, you know, some perspective on what to maybe expect? Um, yeah, so I can, I would say, um, like, I don't know if this is the right word to use, but like the logistics of your relationship. Mm -hmm. So like how you operate, you know, your household is something that, um, you know, only the two of you have to approve of. It's something that only the two of you um, have to work through because nobody else has to live in your household but you, um, the two of you. So as far as, um, you know, working through things in the relationship, working through the the processes that you're going to implement in your relationship is um, what, you know, I would say, aside from the communication, that's something that we've had to work through um, together. And it has been a struggle trying to figure out how to actually operate together and work together in a marriage because, you know, like we said, we, neither of us really had those examples. So we don't really know, you know, what my role is or what his role is. So we have to really create our own, you know, expectations. And I think, you know, that's another thing is um, we have these fake expectations based off of, you know, movies and, you know, TV and things like that of, okay, this is what a wife is, this cookie cutter wife. And, you know, this is what a cookie cutter husband is supposed to be, but that's not always how it works. You know, he washes dishes. He could, he can cook, you know, in the kitchen. (laughs) So like deciding and working through how we're going to work together um, was something that we had to, and we still are working through something that we had to work through um, really in the beginning so that it wasn't like one person doing everything and then the other person you know, not doing anything or vice versa. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that the challenge for me initially was working through what she already mentioned about her stubbornness and wanting to be independent and wanting to do things for herself. Mm-hmm. Um, it, for her, she used to be so bogged down and frustrated because 
she would take on all these things and not like mention she wouldn't even mention what she's trying to do mm. so it would just be like well I'm doing all this and then now I'm frustrated because you sat back and didn't do anything well I also didn't know what you were trying to do <laughs> so that's why I sat back and like yo mm. what is it that I can do mm. um so now it's a lot more um, intentional for us as far as just discussing like clearly hey I'm doing this can you do that or you know um, whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish is more of a togetherness versus uh, one person just carrying the load um, which it was mainly her um, carrying a lot of the load on her own um, versus just communicating so that we could uh, walk forward together yeah. Um, I I usually don't um, come up with many ideas like oh uh, like let's take the family to Disney World like that's usually not my idea. <laughs> um, but I'm fully supportive of it. But in the early stages, she would just, and this is like exaggerating, but she would go pack all the suitcases. <laughs> Uh, get everything together, buy all these outfits for the kids, and then be like, oh, we're going to Disney World next week. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's that's kind of like how it would be. And you'd be like, all right, well. I, I could have helped, helped you pack. Yeah. <laughs> I could have helped you book the hotel. Yeah, I could have uh-huh. helped gotcha. you do all this. But, um, like, I think the more we progress in our styles of communication and the, the efforts that we made, like the better off our relationship is gonna be. Like, um, I, I'm excited to see where we'll be five years from now, mm-hmm. um, because I think like the the progress that we made, and um, I used to be like a, a question that I, I would ask her too, like, um, like this time last year, how do you feel like we've progressed? Um, right those were things that was important to me because I wanted to know like do you feel like we're still in the same position or do you feel like we're growing you feel like we're better off um and I I changed it to now like I asked her like usually we have some type of dinner for our anniversary Mm -hmm. um whether it's on the day that weekend or whatever we have some type of dinner and that's one of the questions that I intentionally asked during the dinner like Nice. All right, looking back, where do you feel we are compared to last year? Mm-hmm. Um, because I want us to continue to move forward. Yeah. Uh, if I got to put in more work for that to happen, sure, I'm, I'm willing to do it. Um, one of the things that I think kills a relationship is if you're always looking for a way out when things become tough versus looking for a way to be better to make the relationship work. Mm-hmm. trying to be part of the solution yeah mm-hmm. yeah I think that kind of ties back to owning you know the marriage instead of walking out so I love that and I also love how you do the progress check-ins like hey I want to make sure that you know and I feel that you know we have to be intentional with that we have to be intentional with growth and with making progress and a lot of times like you said that complacency is what's going to kill the relationship because people aren't even asking those questions and you know being intentional about it so excellent points. I love it. All right. Yeah, so, did we answer the question? Yeah, you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you guys did um, because it was talking about, you know, some of the struggles that you guys face, whether it was on individual level or as a couple. And um, I think that you both addressed it. Okay. Very well. <laughs> yes, thank you. So the next question I have is, what advice would you offer to Black singles that you wish you would have known sooner about marriage? And maybe what are some of the hard conversations that singles should be having before considering marriage? Um... Um, hard conversations that I think um, we should be having, that singles should be having if you're considering or, you know, wanting to be married, um, is definitely your goals. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? You know, how are you going to help me with what I want to do with my life? And don't be afraid to ask people, you know, what they bring to the table. You know, what are you bringing to the table besides, you know, something that I don't need? You know, how are you different? I think it's important to have, you know, those conversations. I think it's important for you to discuss um, not just your goals as far as, you know, career and business and things like that, but also what are your relationship goals and expectations? 
because we think that what the way we think and the way we process everyone else thinks and processes the same way but that's not true so you know you may have one you know expectation and if you don't set that expectation it's not fair to get mad at the other person for not meeting that expectation so what what are your expectations what are your personal goals and what are your relationship goals and expectations and i think that um discussing um the spiritual aspect of it as well is mm-hmm. important. Uh, I think uh, people don't realize that a relationship is three people. Like I mentioned in one of my responses, it's yep. three, three-way strand. And um, if you guys are not on the same page spiritually or, you know, the same religious space, um, it's going to get hard for you guys to um, work through difficult times. If you're not, if you're not fighting the battle the same way, Mm-hmm. You're not fighting using the same tools. It can be difficult for you guys to work through, you know, difficult times. And not to say that if you guys have different, you know, viewpoints or religions that you can't make your marriage work. I just think that if you have different religious views, it can um, it make it difficult, like I said, for you guys to really fight those battles. Like we both, you know, we know how to pray for each other. We know how to pray for others. We know how to pray for our marriage. And we use the same book (laughs) and the same scriptures to fight those battles. So it makes our prayers a little bit more powerful and it makes our, you know, our weapons a little bit more powerful when we do it together and when we're doing it the same way. Um, So those would be the the three things that I think, you know, people should be discussing, you know, your intentions, your setting your expectations, Mm -hmm. um, learning the other person's expectations, and then also discussing, um, you know, and making sure that you are compatible spiritually as well. Love it. All right, Maurice. Uh, I think if I had to add on to those, I would say that um, one of the main things that people don't really discuss is uh, like family history, Mm. Um, knowing um, about your partner um, and their family, like where they come from, how they were raised. a lot of people kind of omit that until they really like meet the family and then they're just like kind of learning like, oh, that's that cousin that's drunk all the time. <laughs> like, um, those things are usually not discussed until it's mm. too late. Uh, not saying that it's a, a limiting factor, but it helps you to know um, where they come from. Yeah. Um, then also um, things like such as your credit, like, um, is your credit score of 400 right now? Like, are we going to spend the first few years of our marriage trying to get you out of debt? Like, mm-hmm. um, I think know. that's good. That's definitely a good one because, like, we, I feel like we both, well, I'll say, I feel like I didn't really know much about um, building credit and healthy, um, you know, credit practices until we started working together to like build our credit, you know, for getting a home and things like that. So I think that's okay. a good one too. Okay. Um, but yeah, like, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of people that got like, you know, piles of student loans and stuff like that. Um, like, is that something that we're going to spend the initial part of our relationship trying to pay off? Like, where's our money really going to go to? Um, Mm -hmm. those type things. Um, I would say also your career aspirations. I mean, you kind of touched on a little bit, but, um, it's fine if, if you want to uh, work at McDonald's for the rest of your life. It's not mine. It, <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's not totally fine. fine if you want to work at McDonald's for the rest of your life. But there's a difference between being the person who fries the fries at McDonald's <laughs> and the person who is the general manager yeah. of this McDonald's. Mm, gotcha. Are you having aspirations of eventually owning your own or being a general manager, regional manager? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. What, are you, what are you doing with yourself? Um, that makes sense. Those are, sense. those are things that usually don't get talked about until um, like down the road when you're like wondering why there's not enough money coming in. Then mm-hmm. you're like, oh, well, what are you doing on your job? Like, are you, are you trying to get a promotion or anything? Yeah. <laughs> like those are those type of conversations. And then also, um, a lot of people like omit, and I didn't really uh, learn this until I, I talked to a lot of my friends, but a lot of people omit like health issues. 
Mm. Uh, they don't really talk about health issues until like they're uh, kind of deep in. So I, I would definitely discuss that too. Love that. Um, yeah. You know, like um, I've known in my past, like people who would omit like certain health issues just so they didn't scare the person off initially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I think you just have to be right up front with that type yeah, of information. Absolutely. And then you should also be concerned about the person that you're with. Like what type of health issues do you have? Yeah. Um, if you scare them off, then that's not the right person for you exactly. anyway. So right. just go ahead and tell them up right. Yep, exactly. Sure. I love that. And I wanted to ask too, like um, when it comes to having these hard conversations, like you mentioned, like with the health and maybe scaring people off, I guess like, what kind of advice or would you offer to people that are fearful of like, okay, I know I have like maybe all this debt and maybe that's not attractive. I know that I have this health issue that's probably gonna put a strain on the person I'm talking to in the future. What kind of advice would you offer to people that are nervous about either giving that information or like even maybe receiving that information? Like what kind of mind frame um, would you tell them to maybe have when they're having those hard conversations? Yeah, I, I would say um, you can't be complacent. Uh, going back to that previous point, you can't be complacent. Uh, showing them that you have a plan, like if you're in $20,000 worth of debt, showing them your plan to pay that off nice. yeah. or to address it in some type of way. I mean, you may not be paying it off, mm -hmm. you know, right away, but um, this is actually showing them how to really address that. If you come with a plan, usually, and this is not just um, in relationships, but in business period. If you come with a plan, people mm. will take you more seriously than if you just come up and say, hey, I got this idea, mm -hmm. I wanna start this company. Um, if you come with a business plan saying, this is what I wanna achieve in three years, mm -hmm. this is my five-year timeline, this is the products that I wanna have. Yeah. Like these are the type of things that people like to see that says, okay, you're not just going to have that sitting as, you know, weight on your back. You're actually trying to do something about right. it. You're not just letting life happen to you. Right. right. Love it. That's good. That's exactly what I was going to say, too. Did you have like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what I was going to say is, you know, um, one, if you can't, if you are not able to be honest with that person, then that's just not the right person for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, number two is, you know, if you have, you know, health issues or, you know, if you have debt, are you allowing that to um, hold you back in any way? Are you allowing that to um, restrict you from, you know, moving forward and progressing? Is it keeping you stagnant? Um, you know, or are you going to use that to not really, maybe not your advantage if it's a health issue, but your debt, you know, okay, I have this student loan debt, but my degree is going to allow me to make, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, figures, or, you know, I may have this health issue, but, um, you know, we connect, uh, we have a special connection. Don't allow just one thing about a person to completely turn you off from them. Looking at the person as a whole, yep. you know, is the important thing, you know, the yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, even like on the health issue, as long as that person is, you know, getting the help that they need and doing what they're supposed to do, you know, to like not make that so much of, I guess, like a burden on the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, because there are certain things that you just have no control over right. that you can help. So like you said, when you look at the person holistically, okay, they might be dealing with this, but like you both said, like, okay, what are you doing about it? Then the only thing else I was going to say was, um, you know, if you have a problem and you don't know how to handle it, just being honest. Like, I think it's okay if you don't know. Like, okay, I have all of this debt from school, but I don't know what career path I can use my degree in, or I don't know where to start applying for jobs in my, you know, field that I graduated in. And then that's really going to, is this person going to use that as an excuse to not be with you or are they going to use this as a way to help you figure out like okay you have a degree in communication try this job or that job da, da, da. so yep. if you don't know you know just say that you don't know how to deal with this and then if it's the right person for you they're going to help you find a, a solution or you know try to help you give ideas and speak life into you versus saying oh well you don't have a plan, so I can't be with you. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. I love the honesty aspect. I do think that more of that is needed in the dating 
world today. Were you trying to add something, Maurice? Uh, I was just going to add on to the other point that she was making about like health issues and stuff like that. Like, um, and it, it was just a quick comment. It was just saying like, it's a difference between like knowing you have high blood pressure and continuing to eat like a lot of high Unhealthy salt food. foods, high sodium foods uh, that's not going to help you to deal right. with like having diabetes and still, you know, consuming all this sugar. Yeah. Um, those are different cases but if you are actively like living a healthier lifestyle because you have this that shows that you actually have a plan and you care about um, things for your future Mm -hmm. um and i think um one of the questions my mother-in-law asked me um when i told her that i wanted to marry her daughter was (laughs) what are your intentions with my daughter Mm -hmm. um what do you have planned for the future? Um, and I think that is a very important aspect of um, relationships. I mean, other things too, but relationship is having a plan for the future, having an outlook for future and not just looking at, oh, well, we feel, you know, so in love right now. Yeah. I mean, love ain't going to carry you through everything. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you're right love, love can't uh get your credit score high enough <laughs> so um you, you gotta work towards things and yep. you know have a plan and be able to approach things um and be vulnerable i mean mm-hmm. it takes vulnerability to say hey i mismanaged my credit when i was younger uh and say um hey you know i lived this wild lifestyle when i was younger and now i need to you know, clean it uh, up. be serious and clean up these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just think that um, it takes more strength to be vulnerable. Yes. You know, most people think the opposite. Most people think vulnerability is automatic weakness, we- mm-hmm. but it takes more strength to be vulnerable. It takes yeah. more strength to forgive. It takes more strength to um, actually put in the work to make things better yeah. than running away. Absolutely. I love that. All right. So I want to get to what you said, um, Shaniqua, um, in your um, response. You said um, to take a moment to evaluate if this is really a red flag to call it quits, or is this something meant to test your commitment when it came to the question of what advice would you offer um, to singles? So can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, spill a tea is what I had said <laughs> and go into more detail on maybe each one like what do you so singles can better understand um, how can one tell the difference between a red flag or it being a test and um, or is it like being vulnerable or desperate like can you break down like maybe I guess like how can singles tell based on your response um, um okay so, uh, I can do that I can try to do that so <laughs> I think one is intuition. So I think that intuition is very real. Like if you get a bad vibe or bad energy from a person, then, you know, I think that you should absolutely, you know, go with your first instincts. I discern it. I think that that's 100% real. Um, The second thing that I would say is, um, you know, how you can tell is, um, is this something that's happening over and over with this person? Like, is it a repetitive pattern? Um, Like, you know, with Maurice, like he said, instead of um, our communication getting the best of us, we are working on how we can make it better. You know, how can I improve this? Instead of, you know, it constantly being a problem or constantly being a revolving door, how can we fix this and make sure that it's constantly a progression versus repetitive, always having the same problems with the same people? Like if it's somebody who is constantly, you um, I don't know, just being drastic, cheating on you. Okay, if you forgive them one time, then okay, that's it. Like that is your one and only get out of jail free card. Um, You should not have to put up with somebody constantly doing that to you or constantly mistreating you. Um, Love languages. If you um, express, you know, my, I like words of affirmation. I like, you know, um, quality time. Um, If they're not, able or available to spend time with you over and over and over or I'm always busy or I'm always working then that's a red flag <laughs> that's not like um something that they're going to change you know if they're constantly like oh you you want to spend quality time but he's always working or she's always working or you know they don't ever make time for y'all two to do anything mm-hmm. together 
that's a red flag. It's not something that's probably going to change. Um, opportunities or, um, you know, an opportunity or a test is where, you know, like he said, if you come to a crossroads about something, discussing it and deciding, hey, this is how we're going to handle this in the future if it comes up again. And then when it comes up again, that's a test to say, okay, am I going to, are we going to stick to what we said over last month? Are we going to stick to what we said of how we're going to handle this if it came up again? Now, you know, a month later, you're in this test. You have to decide if you're going to stick to your commitment or if you're going to fall back into, Default. you know, your old habits. Yeah. You, really, you know, like I said, that's just a decision. You know, people don't realize that marriage is about, you know, choice and life in general is just about choices that you make. You either choose to do the right thing or you choose to do the wrong thing. You choose to see the bright side or you choose to see the negative side. So um, making sure that you're sticking to your commitments. You know, if you say, um, I'm going to make time once a month, we're going to have a date night, you know, once a month, if that's what you want to do. If he breaks that commitment or she breaks that commitment, they're not taking you seriously. It's a red flag. It's not a test. Because a test, you're going to continue to um, stick to what you guys agreed to. And a test, you're going to be able to overcome, you know, whatever the obstacle is. But if you're not making time for me, you know, just sticking with that yeah. example, if you're not making time for me, we're not overcoming this. Right. So it's a red flag. I love the analogy that you just made as far as like with the whole test, because I feel like a lot of times people are um, like, the, just like how the question that I just asked, it was like, okay, how do you tell the difference between whether it's a test or whether it's really a red flag? Oftentimes, if it's a test, like you said, you're going to maybe have that conversation or like have that opportunity where like, okay, you identify that this is an issue, a potential issue, a potential red flag maybe even, but here's the plan that we're working on to address it the next time that it happens so that we're making progress. A red flag, like you said, is also something that's just gonna be something that just maybe keeps popping up and there's not gonna be a change in it. And if a lot of people, I feel like a lot of single people, what happens is, is that we don't like say, hey, you know, I would like more quality time or hey, I would like date night or hey, let's come up with a plan to address this issue that one of us or both of us might be having. And when we don't voice that concern, then it can kind of be like, okay, this is a red flag, but also did you give an opportunity to like, I think it has to, it boils down to being transparent and being yep. honest. It wow. boils down to that because otherwise it's always gonna be seen as a red flag if you never just be honest and say, okay, this could be a potential test, let yep. me, have this conversation and then next time I know if this person keeps defaulting and not making the quality time keep right. making the same choices then I know for a fact okay that's a red flag versus a test for us to build so I love the analogy that you made with that great analogy I was gonna I was just gonna say um that like even in even in um scripture and religion um God isn't always is gonna some can sometimes test you for with what you want and put what you want right in front of you but like you can't I feel like you can't pray for a, a husband or pray for a wife but you're not willing to you know put in the work and the effort on your part to be ready to take on our partner and um, do the work that's necessary to make the marriage long lasting so um, being prepared you know for those tests and um, making sure that you're also doing your part. So it's yeah. not just always the other person. You know, if Absolutely. you see a red flag, you have to be the one to say, hey, this is a red flag to me. Why do you leave your dirty clothes <laughs> on the floor? This is a red flag to me. Like, I, how are we going to make this work? Because for some people, that could be a pet peeve. And if it's a pet, if it's constantly something that they do, how can they know that it's annoying you if you don't speak up and say like, that's annoying. Why aren't you putting your clothes in the hamper? Right, right, <laughs> absolutely. And I think that touches on another great point going back to the whole, if you don't like take that time to know yourself, there's definitely a process of a single person mentally preparing themselves and, you know, conditioning their mind and, you know, certain aspects of their lifestyle to be ready for being in a relationship so that like when you get in the relationship, it's not like, okay, I didn't know you're so messy. You know, can you do the laundry? Can you pick up your clothes? So definitely a lot more of that needs to be happening. You know, before, like you said, people are like praying for husbands or praying for wives. And it's like, okay, well, are you praying that you are ready to receive that and to right. be in that relationship? Love it. Did you want to add anything, Maurice? No, I, I think you covered that pretty well. I mean, okay. <laughs> 
cool, cool. So the next question that we have is, in what ways do you feel the Black community's experiences or struggles with marriage and love and family may or may not be unique in comparison to another culture? Uh, I think, uh, even going back to my answer, I do for that. I think the there were things put in place um, and factors that influenced uh, Black couples and marriage that made things more difficult. Uh, I think one of the examples I gave was like the, the whole welfare system. Mm -hmm. um, in which like it's designed to keep a woman apart from a man. And that wasn't the original design, but if you go by the basics of what it does, mm. you are staying apart from a man to receive this amount of money. Now you have the choice to either struggle or become better or you know get more money so that you don't depend on that system or you can say, well, no, I'm not going to ever get married because I still want to receive this money. Mm -hmm. I don't think any other um, race has truly dealt with that. Um, when it comes to generational wealth, um, just frankly speaking, like uh, Black people have not traditionally had generational wealth yeah. to pass down. Um, from generation to generation that would um, afford them the opportunity to have mess ups in life, have um, you know mistakes made and still be able to have a good yeah. financial standing mm -hmm. or things of that nature. Um, so when it comes to like, you know, the welfare system example, um, black families were especially in urban areas were more split. Whereas this woman has children by this guy, but she's just not gonna marry this guy because she wants to still receive this amount of money mm -hmm. each month so that she can, you know, take care of her lifestyle and support her children the way that she um, has been. And so when you have that to happen for multiple generations, I think it causes a shift and not only the way it's thought about, but also just the way it's approached, because mm -hmm. then you have that whole uh, single black woman, I'm strong, I don't need nobody type attitude mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that develops from that. And it's a cycle because you've seen your mama be that way. You've seen this other woman over here be that way. You've seen this woman be that way. And it's a cycle that will continue yep. if you don't ever choose to break it. And so um, I think that developed a, a generational shift in which it was okay for Black women to not be married and just have these children and raise these children on her own. To be strong. And have her little boyfriend and be strong and be independent and have this boyfriend but he doesn't have to provide anything for the household mm -hmm. or have the, the father of the children be on child support to where all of his check is pretty much going for these kids and he can't even afford yeah. a life or a household for the kids to even come stay in. Yeah. So um, if you take all of that and package it up for years and years and years, um, it causes just a, an, an overall rift Mm -hmm. in the the family dynamic the family yes. system yes. the way families are thought about um and i think for us we just intend to change all that nice love it um for me i think that um all things concerning black and african black people african-american uh, it's unique um our experiences are unique. Our relationships, marriages are unique. Um, our education is is unique. Um, so I would say yes, absolutely. Um, it is a unique um, situation. Um, I agree with what my husband said, but also adding to that, um, for me, I feel like it's unique because um, 
and not playing victim, but I feel like we are already at kind of a disadvantage. So me, I'm already a minority. I'm, I'm already a black woman. I'm already at a disadvantage anyway. Any place I go, I am already at a disadvantage because of the color of my skin and because I'm a woman. Ever. So that puts me at about 45, 50%, right? I'm not at 100% like other cultures or other races. Like, you know, a white woman might walk in and she might be, you know, at a step above, let's say 75%. Yeah, but I'm here. they have here. voting rights before us, though. So. <laughs> I'm right here at 50%, you know what I'm saying? So, and then, so when I add a Black man to what I am, he doesn't necessarily take me to 100% because he's not 100% because where he goes, he's already, you know, at a disadvantage as a black man. So two people at a disadvantage doesn't, you know, really do anything when we're, when we're both at a disadvantage that doesn't really, you know, do anything for us, if that makes sense. He's can maybe get, maybe us together would put us at like 85% versus a white couple being at a hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? It, I hope that that's transferring or translating okay. properly. Um, I feel like that's why, you know, a lot of, uh, that's why Black relationships and Black marriages are at, um, are, are at, a, at a low, or um, that's what makes us unique, is because, you know, we're already um, at a disadvantage individually. And then when you put us together, yes, that makes us, that improves us, but it still doesn't put us at the same, you know, level or the same, you know, position okay. with the same opportunities as other cultures and other um, races. Um, I feel like it's unique also in the fact that, um, in the fact that um, having examples of healthy marriages, um, I feel like, and I think I was talking to my mom about this today, I feel like other cultures and other, um, you know, races, when they are like together, they just like stay together forever. There's nothing that they could, that could ever like tear them apart. <laughs> They've been together since they were 15 and they're like going to be together forever. But I feel like the least little thing we don't know how to handle as, you know, in our culture. So the least financial trouble that you have as a couple, y'all, you don't know how to hand, we don't know how to handle it. We're not equipped with the tools to know what to do, um, you know, if we have a financial situation that, you know, we're frustrated about. We don't know how to work through that. We don't know how to improve that because we don't have the tools in some cases. We don't have the knowledge in some cases to be able to work through, you know, if, if you know, my husband lost his job today or I lost my job today, that can put a strain, a serious strain on the relationship and we don't have the tools mm -hmm to work through that and we don't have the knowledge to work through a person you know losing half of their income and it puts a strain on the relationship so there's not as many successful examples and there's not as many successful marriages because we just don't have the tools or the knowledge to know how to work through xyz problem gotcha gotcha i would definitely agree that you know the black community generally speaking does face you know unique challenges where it does like you said, put that individual at a disadvantage. And then when you come together and form a family unit, then, you know, it could even make it maybe more stressful, add more pressure. Um, something that I would like to comment on what you said earlier, Maurice, about um, like the welfare system and that kind of like reinforcing the strong black woman mentality and the mentality that the black man is not necessarily essential to the family unit. Um, that was definitely by design. And there are still, I feel, systems in place. And that's kind of what this platform was kind of based off of and started on as well, is that, you know, I noticed those things and I'm like, okay, it was very intentional, very by design to break up the union and the respect and the love between the black man and the black woman, very intentional, very by design. And just the one example you touched on with the welfare system, taking that black father out of the home and being that example and that role model, that's just one of the many, you know, variations that we still see of that intentional design from way back when. So very, re very relevant um, what you were saying about that. Um, something that you had said um, was, so not only do we have to fight harder for the basic needs of survival, like a steady well-paying job, building credit responsibly, purchasing a home, we also must use extreme caution in certain situations, which is extra weight added that other cultures may not have. And I believe because of this, a lot of us have created a hard exterior 
as a defense mechanism, but at the same time, it's extremely difficult for good to get in and for love to get in because we've kind of built up that strong um, defense mechanism. Um, so I feel that, you know, I think you covered it a little bit when you were diving into, you know, the differences, the challenges that we face and having that, you know, building that strong exterior. But um, did you want to add a little bit more um, as far as like when we go through these unique challenges, how that kind of hardens us as maybe individuals? And it's hard for us to like be, I guess, in that vulnerable space to, like you said, sustain when we go through challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So as a, as a um, Black woman, I not only have to worry about myself and my safety, when I go places, I also now have the added pressure and the added concern of my husband when he leaves the house and goes certain places. Um, you know, if he gets pulled over, of course, you know, there's always, deep nowadays, there's always that fear. If he yeah. has an encounter with the police, um, I'm always, you know, ready and prepared to stand by him and defend him 100%. Um, but that is added pressure on our relationship because you know, how we handle certain situations and how we react in certain situations is different than other cultures and other races because, um, you know, if we get pulled over, you know, he has to respond and act a certain way. So mm -hmm. I have to respond and act a certain way to make sure that we both are 100% right. safe. Because when you um, get pulled over, you're already being approached with maybe a bias or already a projection of who you right. are and what you're going to respond as. So. Yep. And I think that some, I think, um, I think a lot of times we don't want that, um, we don't want to fall in love um, because of the fears that we have. And that's definitely one of the fears, like, am I going to lose my husband to police brutality? Am I going to lose my husband to racism? Um, you know, different things like that are factors. So I think sometimes we put up this wall and this exterior because, we don't want to have another person we're afraid to lose. I'm already worried about my little brother. He's a, a young black male, worried about my mom. She's a black, you know, African-American woman, worried about my little cousins, young black men. And now I'm going to add in another, yet another person that I'm afraid to lose because of simply the way that he was born, the color that he was born. And um, now we are bringing in more people, yeah. our children, yeah. you know, that we have to be worried about and concerned about because now I have to teach my son, don't put your hands in your pocket when you're in the store. Mm -hmm. Don't put your hood on, you know, when you're in the store, take your hoodie off when you walk in somewhere so people can see your face. Um, you know, if you have an encounter with the police, make sure that you, you know, keep your hands visible. I'm having these conversations with my four-year-old son because I want him to know growing up, people do not see him as I do, simply because he's an African-American boy and he cannot do certain things. Yeah. Um, so I think that we allow that to limit us and restrict our hearts because we don't want to be heartbroken. So, you know, we're like, you know, I, I can't lose, be worried about another person. I can't lose another person. Um, you know, I can't be concerned to put that extra weight on myself. So I'm just going to close myself off and not be open to love and not be open to a relationship because I can't take losing someone that way. I wouldn't be able to handle it. So, you know, I think that there are a lot more women like that, you know, yeah. as well. I want to touch on two folds. So two sides of what you just said. I definitely agree. The more that I've been talking to black men and, you know, kind of picking apart their brains to understand them better. Because, you know, the Black man in America, he does have a very unique experience. So you definitely, like, as a single woman, when you're looking at dating, you know, the Black man, um, then you do have the consideration of two things. One, there's the stigma and, like, you know, the biases that's already thrown on a Black man. Like, hey, he does, you know, good for nothing, drugs, all this other stuff. He's just mm -hmm. trouble. So there's that one stigma that single, single woman might have. And then the other side of that is, like, what you pointed out is, like, okay, he's probably gone through all these experiences and he's like looked at this certain way. This is how the world looks at him. This is how the world will look at our children. And then having that, like you said, extra pressure and concern. So from a single woman standpoint, I think there's two perspectives when it comes to the black man is one, falling into what you know the media paints him as, what society paints him as, and then also Two, if you do decide and you understand history and you understand like, hey, there are certain things that are just by design that's been put in place to already, you know, 
paint your image and perception of the black man and to keep that division going, then you do have those concerns about losing him to those same, you know, biases and that same racism. So twofold. <laughs> and yeah. it, that just speaks to the unique challenges that, you know, we have in the black community when it comes to looking at love and building relationships. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Um, and then something else you said just made, had made me have another thought and I know we're going over the time, but, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but um, another thought that I had too, is, as far as, you know, caring for and loving um, a black man is keeping him motivated because like, yeah. you have so many things stacked against you. You have so many things that are like, man, I'm, you know, like he said, he's always trying to be like the best, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And they, you know, certain places and certain jobs still don't give you a chance. They still don't yeah. give you opportunity. They don't give you the salary you deserve. They don't give you the promotions that you deserve. Even after you go in there and you're like a one at everything and you're the best at everything, they still don't give you fair opportunities. So keeping, you know, him motivated and still speaking life into him while everyone else is like okay you're just not you're not good enough no matter what you what you do you're not good enough no matter how good you are you're not good enough so now you know I have the challenge of having to you know speak life into him more frequently because he's constantly you know being a provider is the, should be uh the number one thing for a man and I believe that it is regardless of their financial status yes. I believe most men their number one priority is to be able to provide yes. so if you take that away from him and you you minimize or limit his ability to provide for a family he's going to be less likely to go out and get a family exactly I was going to touch on that I was going to touch on that because again I've been speaking to you know black men and like from what I've gathered from them is that that is like top priority that even affects their ability to like even maybe consider taking a relationship seriously with anybody is like okay do I have the means can I provide for a family you know can I take care of myself can I take care of a family so again twofold um like okay in the black man's mind he's like okay am I in a position to have a family because mm -hmm. of the way society has kind of like already put me at a disadvantage and then like you said from the woman's standpoint is being that source of strength and motivation while he's going through all of that and trying to like you know keep him motivated experiencing all of that so spot on definitely wow great points <laughs> <laughs> all right let's keep it moving a little bit um how do you feel any of your childhood experiences may have impacted your adulthood and how you show up in marriage um I think we touched on it a little bit before. Um, of course, we both were raised in single parent homes. Um, so I think you're kind of left with two choices, right? Um, as a person being raised in a single parent home, you can either try to continue with what you saw and was raised with, mm -hmm. or you can try to be different. Um, and I think for us, our commitment to be different um has forced a bond between us that even when we're angry with each other even when, even when we're um you know disgusted at the side of each other um uh, we still realize that we need to come together and make this family work so that we can do things differently um just because it's challenging doesn't mean it's impossible um, that's one of my favorite sayings, like mm. difficult doesn't mean impossible. So, right. um, the difficulties that you have in marriage usually come from your experiences because, uh, you either experience like hurt in the past or your experience shows you that, uh, men are dogs or mm -hmm. your experience shows you, you know, different things and it causes you to form that, but your the way you handle it um, doesn't have to be based on your experience. And I think that's the key to um, moving forward in a relationship is just understanding that um, you can move beyond all that and knowing that you don't have to be the same way that your mother was. You don't have to be the same way that your father was. You can be different. Mm -hmm. um, you can take the good and the bad. Um, like uh, old people used to say, eat the fish and throw out the bones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you take the good and throw away the bad and just make sure that you apply the things that you need to that's going to make your marriage work versus um, just giving up. Yeah. Okay. 
agree. Um, I would say for me as an indiv- as an individual, you know, different things from my childhood, I feel like I've always had a very fortunate lifestyle. Like I don't, I've never had to, I don't feel like we ever really had to struggle the way some other people that I know have. Um, so I think that having that, um, security, you know, from my mother, even though she was a single, a single parent, you know, having that security and we may have been struggling, but she never like really let me know that. So, (laughs) um, you know, um, like I had, I always had clothes. I always had, you know, phones, everything I needed for dance, cheer. Like I always had that, those things versus like, you know, my husband, his story is a little bit different and um, not to discredit either mother is just like his experience is just a little bit different. So I think having that soft, cushy um, childhood has made me kind of um... spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> that has made me kind of not spoiled. Okay, I'm not spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> not spoiled I would say kind of it's sheltered I would I would more so say it was, it was very sheltered um I haven't had very a lot of experience in having to struggle or go through certain mm-hmm. things with you know my husband he has a little bit more um strength you know in that category and I think that's one of the things that like he has expressed concern about before is making sure that our kids like if they ever have to struggle or go through something see she said my baby struggle or go through something (laughs) then they know how they are equipped with the tools we raise them in a way that they know how to overcome struggles so um you know I think that my childhood has affected me in that way as you know one thing is like you know um I guess it's kind of a good thing it could be bad thing I don't know but I think that's how it's kind of affected me in the marriage because like I have certain expectations of my husband, like, (laughs) 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 like, (laughs) um, so I think that that has affected me, um, affected our marriage, you know, in that way, and then I also think that, you know, um, you know, in childhood, I have, um, struggled, um, not struggled, but my mom, because she was, um, you know, so independent and so strong, and so, you know, just, you know, strong and independent um I think that she did she wasn't very um emotionally and she's a Scorpio she's not very emotionally connected to a lot of people like um I have to say like I love you like three times for her to say it back like she's not like (laughs) huggy like huggy type person kissy type person or anything like that she's not really you know a lovey-dovey type of person but me, on the other hand, with my kids, like I am constantly kissing on them. I'm constantly telling them that I love them. So, you know, having that experience in my childhood is something that I wanted to be different, you know, as far as in my marriage and also with my kids. I'm very, um, you know, forthcoming. I reaffirm them, like just randomly. I'll be like, oh, you're the best husband or you're the best, you know, husband, you're the best dad or whatever. You're a good dad. I, you, I affirm them a lot. And I, you know, hug them and I kiss them and I, you know, treat them, you know, very affectionately. So I think that that has affected me, you know, from something from my childhood that has affected, you know, my marriage and my parenting style, Um, just to name like a few things. Of course, we learned a lot from my childhood and, you know, how we are today is a lot to do with our childhood. So that's just to name just a few things. (laughs) Okay. Love it. Love it. Let's go on to the next one. Um, could you guys share your thoughts on relationships, dating, and marriage today? And um, what do you feel is needed to make marriage successful? And if you guys, anyone out there, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, then go ahead and drop it in the chat because we're going to get ready to wrap up here in a little bit. So um, if you guys could share your thoughts on relationships and dating and marriage today and what you feel is needed to make it successful. I know communication is one. Communication is definitely uh, number one, but um, I I think uh, what this generation is lacking, and we kind of covered it a little bit earlier, was just uh, um, sticking with the commitment, even when the commitment doesn't feel good. Um, Being able to work through those issues, work through those problems to make it work versus just running away and just trying the next best thing that comes along. Uh, That's one of the main generations 
main generational um, issues that's going on right now, mm -hmm. uh, especially like this whole cancel culture. Uh, everybody just wants to, you know, cut you off. Oh, I, and people are even bragging about cutting people off, mm -hmm. which is yeah. like the funniest thing. But um, this generation lacks sticking to commitments, even when it doesn't feel good. Um, and I think, you know, society has kind of trained people to think that way. Mm -hmm. And um, because there's the whole wave of, uh, well, you don't have to deal with that. Yep. You just, you know, yep. Yep. move on. But that's not what relationships are about. Relationships are not always, you know, fairy tales and, you know, the the crown and the the big princess dress yeah uh, you know mm -hmm. you, you gotta be able to you know get down and scrub the floors every now and then and yeah. put in the work to make it actually um uh, be successful um and I, most people don't understand that marriage is a commitment to work um yes yeah, a commitment and love and everything but it's a commitment to work mm -hmm. um two people have to work to be together and work to um continue to grow together and do things together um and even mature together mm -hmm. um to become better people for themselves individually and for themselves as a couple absolutely um, yeah I'm and i better. think that's just what this generation is lacking absolutely yeah. yeah go ahead that's good um for me i think that um in this generation, I lost my train of thought a little bit. Um, for me, I think that in this generation, we um, we are, how can I say? There is no ex example of a woman who, there's no uh, example that I know of, of a woman in our, or that I can think of right now, of a woman in our generation who, um, is strong but vulnerable at the same time, who is um, classy but sexy at the same time. I think we either have like Megan the Stallions or we have like grandmas. Like there's no happy medium. And I, don't get me wrong, no offense, you know, to Megan or anything like that, but you know, that's not gonna get you a husband. Okay. <laughs> that's gonna get yep. you all of the wrong type of attention and the wrong type of men if that's all you have to offer. Um, so I think that we are, even the music that people are listening to today, the music tells you that you have to be used up, that you have to be physically av available, you know, to a guy for him to treat you like half of a person. And we don't have to be that. And we don't have to believe that. And I think it is, um, it is um, limiting our our expectations. It's, it's lowering our expectations from a woman's standpoint. It's lowering our expectation for these men and these guys. Like you're allowing yourself to be used up because of what a song tells you or because of what the media tells you about your body and about how you have to be used by men or how you have to put out this in order for him to give you X, Y, Z or, you know, um, you know, telling women that, um, you know, you need to use your body to be successful or use your body to, you know, get anywhere in life or get anywhere, be, you know, put yourself on a platform um, sexually um, to be famous or put yourself on to, you have to be sexy or use sex, sex sales, you know, things like that is a part of the problem in this generation. Um, because one, a man doesn't respect that. And number two, you're not respecting yourself. So you can't expect anybody else to respect you. So that's one thing um, is, you know, selling our, we're selling ourselves short when it comes to that. Um, the second thing I think in this generation is um, we are too concerned about what other people think. Uh, we're too concerned about, you know, how this looks or if you're attracted to this type of guy, but he doesn't look how your friend may think that your type is, or he doesn't look a certain way, or he doesn't have X, Y, Z, then he's not good enough for you. So I think it's a combination of both of those things. Like we're selling ourselves short, you know, when it comes to respecting ourselves and, you know, being um, stand up, you know, women uh, of society. And then number two, we are, um, 
we are um dang, I lost my train of thought. What was the second thing I said? <laughs> we are um, was, um I think the two points you said was one, not having respect for ourselves and like like um with the music culture, the representation of that we're putting out with ourselves. Yeah. And then like relying on what other people other people think. Yeah, that's what it was. So I think it's those two things. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, I do have one more question that I would like to ask you guys. And if anyone else has a question, please go ahead and drop it in the chat. The last question that I have to um, ask you guys is being that you both came from single um, mother homes, was there any source, like once you guys got married, was there any other source or like, would you recommend like any other sources of maybe friends or counseling that you went to um, as far as like maybe to with your marriage? Like, was there any other, you know, resources that you guys went to? Um, for me, a resource that I used was, um, was actually, um, our kid's godmother. She is, um, um, she has experience in being married. I don't know, like, blast her, but she's been married, like, several times. <laughs> so, <laughs> you learn from it. so, like, as I grew closer to her, like, just, like, things that she would tell me or things that she would say about her experiences, you know, marrying the wrong people, you know, and then now she's married to someone new and like, you know, realizing that this is the right person for her, just learning and taking in, you know, her, her experiences um, has helped me in my relationship. And um, I would um, also say um, reading. So like, <laughs> I feel like if you want to be good at something, you have to do like, um I don't not like research but like I feel like reading about it learning like how you can be better at something I think is important so like um I like to do like devotionals for wives and like just things like that like even if you're not married um just um you know getting into the habit of you know learning how can I you know be a good wife according to nice. you know the word and aligning with you know what God says a wife should be not what society says a wife should be absolutely um, and then, um, like, listening to different um, podcasts. There are podcasts out there for, you know, single people who desire to be married. There are podcasts for married people. Um, even if you're not married, I think you can still listen to, like, podcasts for, like, married women or podcasts for wives because you're training your mind to already get to the place that you um, want. Right. So Absolutely. Those are some tools that I kind of use. Okay. Nice. Maurice? Yeah. Um, we didn't really like come together and consult any outside sources. Uh, um, I, I really like, um, I didn't want to be influenced by what mm -hmm. other people had as an idea of what a husband should be in their head. Um, because my commitment was to my wife. So I felt like um, I needed to be the best husband she wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, yeah, of course, some things are unrealistic, but the core of things that most women want their husband to be are things that you as a man can be. Um, so it was important for me to find out what she truly wanted um, as a husband from me, for me to fulfill those things and work towards being good at those things. Love it. Um, more than any outside influence and and I, I think um that's one of the the catch-alls of this era is that um there's been so much social media like showing the highlights of people's lives that they other people feel like they have to be like this highlight in order to be successful mm -hmm. um but for for us, that's one of the things, like our marriage is our own. We're not comparing it to anybody else's marriage. We're not comparing it to, you know, some celebrity that we don't even know. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we're comparing ourselves to what we want to be. Um, yeah. Like, I'm happy if the refrigerator is full of water. Like, that, yeah. that makes me happy in my, my marriage. Like, I don't, I don't have to compare it to somebody who says, oh, well, you know, you're you're not settled unless you have ten thousand dollars in your bank account. Yeah. Well, I mean, all right, well, if that's your goal, then go for it. Yeah. But I'd rather have a refrigerator full of water. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's just gotcha. 
I I I literally despise when people have like celebrity relationship goals because it's like you don't know them. Okay, <laughs> the only thing you know about their marriage or their relationship is what their PR person yeah. tells them that they can post on social media. You yeah. don't know if they're really <laughs> happy in their relationship. Right. You don't know how they communicate. You don't know if they even actually sleep in the same bed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, true. Very true. Very true. But I I I despise when I you know feel see people saying like, oh, you know, Jay Z and Beyonce relationship goals. <laughs> I got you. Point taken. <laughs> I love what both of you had to add on that. Um, definitely agree with the uh, you know being in the right frame of mind and going ahead and diving in. Something that I've heard when it comes to a job is like, you know, in order to get the promotion, to get the next job, you kind of already have to be operating at that capacity. So when you say like going, it's okay for like a single woman to go and listen to, you know, a married woman's podcast to learn from that. Definitely agree with that. So, mm-hmm. and yeah, you guys have some great points. <laughs> when it comes to that. So I really okay. appreciate you guys making the time today to, um, sit down and share with the community. Um, I know that we went over a little bit, but that is fine. I'm gonna, you know, a little bit, but um, I really do appreciate you guys making the time to plant the seeds, um, to speak to black love and to show and share from your experiences, you know, what black love looks like and how other people can, you know, get there. And I kind of feel like, again, this is gonna be helping with that mentality for both men and women, which is the goal of this evening. So if there's um, anything else that you guys would like to share before we call it, um no thank you i appreciate the opportunity i'm sorry we we're both kind of long-winded <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but no um i appreciate the opportunity um uh, i uh, pray that something we said resonates with anybody who may watch three player anybody who's watching you know live with us i hope that um something we said you know helps you along in your journey let's have a great evening okay i'll let you guys know when everything's um finished and published okay absolutely thank you yeah, thank you thank you everyone